Um, yeah, so thank you all for coming. There's a few firsts happening for me tonight. First time I've ever spoken in a pub. First time I've ever spoken with a dog in the audience. Um, yeah, I can tell. She's pretty jacked. We can get some bodybuilding tips off this one. Um, and it's also the first time I've spoken in front of my girlfriend at the back there, which is kind of a bit of a surreal thing because I do a lot of talking gigs. So I'm trying to not embarrass her, but definitely, definitely am as well. Um, so I am, I am passionate about applied nutrition. Um, to just quantify what that statement means. I can talk about mechanistic stuff all day, metabolism, glucose, fatty acids, but actually the difficulty that a lot of people have is applying that in their own lives and actually understanding what advice is good advice and what advice is bad advice. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about some of that stuff. Then I'm gonna show off a little bit about mechanistic stuff because that just shows I'm clever. And then from that point there, we're gonna just talk a little bit about some strategies that you guys might use to get the best out of your training um, and looking at some of the pitfalls of trying to apply research that is done in maybe what you would consider elite populations to yourselves, but also little, some little um, tips and tricks that might help as well. So in terms of my business, um, I have two companies. So I have TRA Performance Education, which as the name would suggest, is a performance education company. Um, we fly in experts from all over the world, from all different sports, to come and deliver seminars in the north of England because we are started up here. So basically what we're trying to do is improve coaching education in the UK. So getting people who are on the front of um, health, performance, and a lot for personal trainers as well who kind of do their level three qualifications and then they just get cast out into the wilderness and they're terrible coaches and they don't have the impact that they should. So we're trying to improve that. And I also have a business called Nexus. Um, Nexus started as a fitness writing company, which was something I did when I was finishing off my PhD. Um, and it was just doing a bit of cash on the side. When you write content and it's pretty decent, people tend to take notice and think you're a coach. And I hesitantly entered that world of nutrition coaching and a lot of the content I was writing for the time was for, well, was for the bodybuilding industry. So when they have these eBooks and stuff where different people come out and write things, that was probably me writing most of those ones who decent level guys. So that's what I did. And then people said, well, I don't want to work with that coach. I want to work with you. So I reluctantly took on the coaching thing and really rediscovered my passion for nutrition. Um, my PhD is actually in biomechanics, clinical biomechanics. Um, but I have got nutrition training, so this isn't just something I've decided to just run with as well. Um, and my, my, I've only been in Manchester for a few months now, um, and I'm looking presently to open my first actual performance facility. So I have a physiology lab, which has been based in other establishments, but I'm actually opening my first performance facility, hopefully in the next few weeks. Unfortunately, I've got a trip to America planned, planted right in the middle, and I'll explain why that is in a second. Um, so yeah, um, so that's my really first one, which is Nexus One, an imaginative name, abbreviated to Neo. So that's what I'm launching, hopefully in the next few weeks. So I've just been viewing properties today. So a little bit about me, my background. Did my undergraduate at Leeds University there. I was a rugby league boy by trade. That is me over the bucket there as well. As you can tell, I treated my education really seriously. Um, I was very much a typical lad, went to university, didn't really know what I was doing, so I did a degree in the most broad topic possible, which was sports, health, exercise, and nutrition. So pretty much covered all the bases there as well. So there was a lot of sociology stuff, a lot of psychology stuff, covered a lot of things, and I really loved that. And then from that point then on, I went to do a master's in sports engineering rehabilitation, and for no other reason than the sports science master's was full, and I wanted to stay in uni, which probably isn't the best thing. Um, from that point there, I then applied for and got my PhD, I went to Cardiff, and as you can tell, when I was at Cardiff, I took things really seriously there as well. Um, the first two years of my PhD, I must admit, I did DOS around a lot, didn't really understand what it was about, and then wised up a little bit. Like I said before, in those last few months, uh, last few years, that's when I started writing, becoming known as a, an educator within that community, and um, yeah, started coaching from that point there. In terms of my own sports, I used to wrestle, that is me, I know it's ridiculous. The guy looks like a slightly stacked Jesus there. He's one of the best grapplers. He's one of the best grapplers in the UK. Um, so I used to wrestle at a, a pretty decent level and then broke my hand and my PhD supervisors really didn't like me turning up with black eyes and cauliflower ears. So I then took a little trip to bodybuilding. Um, again, start writing about those communities and then you start to go in that as well. And the reason I'm showing you this, although it's not just to show I'm topless there, I look much better there than I did now, it's because I, I have, Believe in the application of nutrition. I think as a coach, you have to sometimes experience things that your, your athletes do. So that's kind of why I got into it. From that point there, I got sick of dieting, as did my girlfriend, because she hated it, because I turned into a grumpy so-and-so. Um, I then turned into a fat powerlifter, 
<laughs> so they're around about 260 pounds. So in new money, about 120 kilos. Pretty strong, but managed to break my body up pretty badly. Um, and I got to the point where I was so good at powerlifting, I actually developed Jedi level skills. So you can see that. <laughs> I basically just completed powerlifting at that point, so I thought that's it for me. Um, so from that point there, now I'm actually training for my first Ironman distance event. Um, and not just any Ironman, because I don't do things the easy way, much to my own physical and mental detriment a lot of the time. I'm doing the brutal triathlon, the extreme triathlon, which is up and around Mount Snowden. So the actual marathon portion is a trail run that finishes up and down Mount Snowden. So yeah, that's fun. Um, so it's been an experience. I've obviously dropped a lot of weight since those days. And it's really pulled me into this world of endurance sports and something I'm fascinated about. So this is a few of my athletes there. So that's Sonny. He's um, just turned pro boxer. So now obviously I work with athletes. I've come from a fight sport background. So I've worked with fighters, MMA fighters, a lot of good pros. Um, that guy's a muscle model pro. And then from that there, and completely randomly why I'm off to the US, I actually work with professional ice hockey players. So that's me in the, the um, locker room of the Detroit Red Wings, so NHL team. That guy there is worth about $4.2 million a year in the middle. So like looking after him and his ilk are quite scary. So weird story, bodybuilding led me to go to the US to do some talks out there. And then from that point, um, yeah, I got known for nutrition. Hockey players went to work in the off season. So I worked with a few NHL guys. And that's why I'm going out there in a few weeks time because we've got an off season program put in place where I do all the physiology testing, I do all the nutrition stuff and a lot of behavior stuff as well. So one of the fascinating things about athletes is you assume that they're these robots who just do to perform. And that's true when they're in season, but the second their shackles are taken off off season, a lot of them still have the same issues and relationship issues with food that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And some of the nutrition strategies that these guys were trying in their off season would actually astonish you. Probably, you guys would probably know more than they would even though they do it for a living and they're worth so much money. So that's why I've kind of shifted more from the technical stuff to a lot more of the applied stuff and the behavior change stuff is what I do. It's what I kind of have gravitated to specialize in really. So, I'm, obviously then I do a bit of talking every now and again. So that's me with a gentleman called Joe Agu who looks like Johnny Depp. It's not actually me with Johnny Depp. People do think that for a second when they look at it. Um, Joe Agu is a really good performance nutritionist, worked with a load of Olympic athletes as well. So I was talking about um, how the body adapts to changes in energy intake. So that's me really. And what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is we're gonna talk about marathon, but fundamentally endurance performance. So to determine endurance performance, we have VO2 max. Hands up if you've heard of VO2 max before, I'm sure most runners have. Right, brilliant, so I don't need to explain what that is. Not in too much thingy, not in too much detail. Basically, consume more oxygen, burn more fuel, perform better, sweet. We also have economy as well. So running economy um, is things like power to weight ratio. It's to do with your mechanics as well. So you can have two athletes with the same VO2 max, but one is better than the other. The leverages work better, they have better stability, they have better postural control, they're more efficient in the way they move. And then we also have our anaerobic capacity percentage that we can maintain. So the higher intensity we can work at, and our body can then buffer the accumulation of lactate, which is, well, it's the hydrogen associated with the lactate, is what limits performance. The more we can do that, the better our performance is as well. So most people see those things and think they are purely affected by training. Yeah? Most people don't think of those as a nutrition thing, so you might do your high intensity intervals to elicit some of those adaptations. But they are actually elicited by um, nutrition as well. And we can artificially fudge some of these things. So that's me there with, uh, that's Sonny, the boxer. That's me in Leeds, one of my facilities there, doing some testing. I don't normally dress like that, but the heating was broke. <laughs> so I had to like wear a hat and I was freezing cold. And obviously just repping the Red Wings there as well. Um, and that guy's for a student from Leeds Beckett University who come to shadow me for the day called Liam. He's a really cool kid. Um, so with that, well, we can artificially fudge VO2 max by reducing our body weight. So maintaining a healthy body weight or losing excess body fat is going to make us more efficient in that regard. Um, also as well, you know, the way I describe it is a lot of uh, work with some athletes who are We'll spend, triathletes in particular, will spend thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds on a road bike to get to say 500 grams in weight, but they're walking around with 20 pounds of excess body fat and you think to yourself, surely there's some discrepancy there where you could get much more of a performance gain and save a few grams for that as well. So we can improve it that way. We can improve our economy by, like I said, if we increase our power to weight ratio, we're gonna become more efficient. I did some calculations on myself and I worked it out. Assume my fitness levels had stayed roughly the same for every, I think it was two kilos I dropped, I saved about 15 seconds per kilometer, assuming anything else had shifted, right? And obviously then as well, from my perspective, being a bit heavier than the average endurance athlete, uh, you know, 
their risk of injury and stuff as well goes down markedly. Um, and then anaerobic capacity as well. I'm going to talk about this a little bit. So that might seem like something that is purely training adapted as well, but actually we can play with our nutrition in order to create similar stresses that we do from training, if we're really clever. And I'm going to tie all this in into a clever little program that I use with some of my athletes who want to drop some body fat maybe, but also want to improve their performance at the same time. And it can be done, believe it or not. You just have to be smart with it. So yes, we can do it with nutrition. So we're going to talk through this now. I'm just joking, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> we will come back to that though, because some of that is relevant there. But fundamentally, that's what happens when we contract the muscle, and that's how we get our physiological adaptation. So the two adaptations we get from training are increased um, capillarization into the muscles, and also we get increased mitochondria, which are energy producing things, so we can use fuel more efficiently, okay? And we can actually use nutrition to create those same adaptations that we do from exercise and activity as well. So we can manipulate it that way. Let's just see what this is. So this is the new and revised healthy eating pyramid from the Department of Nutrition at Harvard. Um, and you notice at the bottom of that pyramid now that it's not carbs, fats, and proteins like the old pyramids used to be. It's actually activity and weight regulation. So the best thing you can do to maintain your health going into older age is activity and also to regulate your weight as well. So from a health perspective, that's great. But also we can see by regulating weight, we're going to have performance benefits. So there's these kind of crossovers. And ultimately, you know, a lot of people focus on performance nutrition. They focus on things like supplementation, carb loading strategies, what you're going to consume whilst you're performing. Excuse me, but you can't have performance without health. Like it's the foundation of the, py the pyramid as well. But what's also cool about that is obviously as endurance athletes, we might shift those ratios around a little bit. So we do need to be specific to our sport. What's also really cool about that is by consuming those kind of foods, we are actually providing um, the nutrients to allow physiological adaptations to take place. So people will think about protein and recovery. Endurance athletes chronically under eat protein. There's more and more research coming out now that just because you're not trying to build muscle doesn't mean you need less protein than strength athletes. It's just the protein is used in a different way physiologically. So whereas a bodybuilder lifts weights and it goes straight to their muscles, you guys, those, mito those mitochondria, you guys need to create those. So there's more and more increasing levels of research now which is showing that endurance athletes need the same amount of protein as strength athletes, which is quite shocking to hear, but it is something it is, and you guys, not saying you guys generally, but generally speaking, endurance athletes do tend to massively under eat on protein. Obviously, things like um, omega 3s from oily fish, <coughs> everyone that knows it's good for the joints, but also controls inflammation and includes, uh, improves cell permeability as well, so the delivery of nutrients to the muscle. Vitamins and minerals, not just for health, they take part in the enzymatic reactions that in, allow you to perform at your very, very best. Um, and obviously alcohol to either drown your sorrows after you've not performed as well as you have, or to just get rid of the pain of training or life in general. Um, <laughs> the sad thing about that is that for some people, they you know the, the daily multivitamin is actually a recommendation on that because people do massively under eat fruits and vegetables, and I'm as guilty of that as anyone. So I'm going to stand here and not tell you, do, do as I say, not as I do. But the good thing is, actually for a lot of people, so... When people come to work with me for the first time, what they think I do is very different to what I actually do. So they think that you come to me and they're like, write me a diet. Firstly, I can't do that. I'm not a dietitian. Only dietitians can write diets. I can give you examples of what I think you should be eating. But actually, a lot of the time when people come to me, what I do is addition and subtraction from the diet, not completely reforming. Because quite often, what you need to do is just think of one or two things you're already doing to actually get to this point. So partly it might be calorie regulation, obviously, if you have an issue with rate regulation, but just things like identifying weak points in the diet. So I use a piece of software called Nutritics. Um, as you can see, this is one of my uh, pro hockey athletes called Xavier Ule, which is a pretty cool name. Um, he plays now for the Montreal Canadiens, I think. He was with Detroit and got traded. That was nothing to do with me. Personality thing, I think. I didn't make him tank, honest. It wasn't my fault. So obviously vitamin D there, he's got a diet that's actually quite high in things like calcium and stuff. Vitamin D is low. So one of the recommendations I was made to everybody here today is if you're not supplementing with vitamin D, start. Um, it's really important for hormonal health, bone health, pretty much does anything and everything in the body. It plays a role in that as well. So if you're not supplementing with vitamin D, please start doing it. Um, if you don't, the only other supplement I would recommend and say is an essential, not an essential, but high, highly likely that is most people need. So if you don't eat a lot of oily fish and stuff, use an omega-3s as well. Really good for cell function. So but, can, I, can I interrupt you? Yes, of course. Can we wait to the end? Um, can we wait to the end? Just because I, I lose my flow if not, and then I'll be like... <coughs> 
So this is this software I use, what I do with my athletes is they come in and I will talk to you guys. So let's say you come in, I'll talk to you about what you do on a daily basis. I will run an analysis. And then what I'll do then is I will recommend one or two things that you can just tweak within the diet that you already have. So you're not having to go off and find quinoa or grass fed, whatever it is that you're supposed to eat. What I can do is I can look at a diet, make those recommendations. Actually, what we do then is build outwards. So it makes it a lot easier for people to kind of change. So it's not a dietary overhaul. It's like, look, this is what you've got. It's probably not as bad as you think it is. What we just need to do is just adjust some things there. So that's the approach I kind of take with people. And then once we've got that, once you've got people eating well generally, then we can worry about the performance nutrition stuff. So many people who are endurance athletes do it the other way around. And, you know, they'll start looking at the supplements and things as well. And then they have issues they're gaining weight because they don't understand that their training output isn't the same as Mo Farah or isn't the same as Chris Froome or someone like that. Yeah, you are not them. Trust me. Is anyone, any, most of you guys on Strava... Yeah. Do you anyone follow Chris Froome on Strava? If you ever want to feel bad about how little training you actually do, um, give him a follow. He's just come back from Colombia a few weeks ago and he was doing like four or five hours a day, 180 kilometers a day on the bike. And like that's just par for the course of power outputs that would make you sick. So yeah, we are not pro athletes and we shouldn't eat like one. We should eat like normal human beings. And then we can tinker some things in and around our bigger events as well, like marathons. <laughs> So I want to talk a little bit about fuel storage, um, not in too much detail. So fat, look at that, how much calories we have stored in fat. They're basically limitless. You're never going to run out of fat. Even if you're not have particularly high body fat, you're going to store some anyway if you've got some in the diet. The one there that is obviously of most, um, most impact or potential impact is uh, carbohydrate. So you have a very little amount of calories and carbohydrate in your glucose just floating around at all times. Your liver has about... Uh, 400 calories, so about 100 grams, maybe slightly more, depending on your body size. And then obviously, your muscle glycogen is about 1,500. Now, here's the issue in muscle glycogen. Once carbs go into so into a muscle, can't get out again. So just because you you know you if you've got loads of glycogen in your upper body, doesn't mean then that when your legs run out, it's going to start pulling it from there. It's completely reliant on the liver. Does anyone know when you're performing what the major um, what's the major limiter? on your capacity to utilize carbohydrates is if you're trying to maintain intensity and why your performance drops off. It's your digestive system. Because you can't uptake carbohydrates quick enough to actually sustain performance at those intensities where you're using mostly carbohydrate metabolism. So the reason we want to mostly focus on carbohydrate metabolism is because it's a more efficient way of using fuel. Fat has more calories per gram, so you get more energy from it. But carbohydrate is more efficient. There's less steps along the chain, so you can make energy at a quicker rate, which means you can maintain a higher level of intensity, yeah? Now, the problem with this is, this is where we talk about individualization with an athlete. There's a difference between somebody who can run a two-hour marathon and someone who runs a four-hour marathon at a plod. And depending on the client that I'm working with, I would use a different nutrition approach. And why would that be? Yeah, let's move on to this one first. Go on to that in a second. Why would that one be? Um, Simply because, even if you're not, your intensity of exercise is lower, you're still going to need to maintain blood glucose levels. So your liver out, your liver's going to run out pretty quickly at that as well. So what I want with someone who's going to be long and slow, maybe a beginner, is I want them to have some form of metabolic flexibility. So they can switch between carbohydrate usage and fat usage. Okay, so we might not be able to perform at those high intensities, but we're getting a little bit from both. Think of it like a hybrid car. Yeah, that's what we're looking for, right? If I've got someone who is running close to two hour marathons, which I know only Kipchoge's got close. Did anyone see the Breaking 2 documentary? Anyone seen that? So what's interesting about that is a lot of people will say, oh, if he could utilize more fat, he would have broke two hours. Wrong. If they could have fed him better and he could have utilized more carbohydrate, he would have broken two hours because it's a more efficient way of doing it. So the difference is there, again, it's contextual. So when you think about nutrition strategies that an endurance athlete's using, it really depends on the duration, but the duration of a marathon could be almost 100% longer for somebody who hasn't, who's, who's new to it, you know? So again, when we talk about these strategies as well, I want, to th I want you to think about these in a very sort of loose way, okay? I don't want you to think I'm talking definitively. Everybody is an individual. So the way I work with clients is, science gives us a framework, but what we do is we work with the people who are within that as well, and that's where testing, physiology, and stuff comes into it, because without that, if you're testing, you're guessing, that's my philosophy as well. So with that, that just demonstrates nicely the contribution to total energy there, that you get from different intensities. So at low intensity, you can see it's mostly fat. And as you then increase intensity to your percentage of VO2 max, you get more carbohydrate. And the reason for that is because you're limited at how quickly you can get fat into your mitochondria to produce energy. So that's why you become reliant on carbohydrate because it's just like turning on a tap. 
as opposed to it dripping. Okay. Here's the problem though. That last graph there where it crossed over at around about 50% is people have different rates of fatty oxidation. Some people are high oxid oxidizers of fat. Now you might think that's great, but it might not be because if they're oxidizing more fat because they can't access the glucose, that means they're gonna only be able to perform at a lower intensity than they would be if they could oxidize more glucose. So it's contextual to the athlete that you're working with. So part of what I do in my kit is I can work this out. Now please don't get confused with defining your fat burning zone. Calories still matter. It's not like if you work at a certain intensity, the, problem, the thing with this is, this is a good curve to say with an athlete, right, okay, well, what can we do nutritionally to shift people's curves? And you can do that. You can do that through dietary manipulation um, and training manipulation as well. I'm not going to get into the technical aspects of that as well, because that's we'll start going down a rabbit hole of um, people start switching off and glazing over and the alcohol starts to look a little bit more uh, tasty. So... When it comes to, um, so this is from the International Society of Sports Nutrition um, review on research and recommendations for performance nutrition. And I've covered them all there because actually I might as well, because the, the performance supplements, the ergogenic aids that actually work, most of them you'll see, you can actually get from the diet. So for building muscle, weight gain powders, again, you could just have more protein and more calories, just high calorie formulation. Protein powders, again, you could just get that from the diet. Protein powders are great though, in the right context. For example, if you struggle to eat enough protein, like we've discussed endurance athletes tend to do. Uh, creatine, would an endurance athlete necessarily need that? It's the short duration energy that you get. Possibly not, it might have some negatives as well because it can make you hold more water, so your power to weight ratio might go down, but then it might have benefits in hydration. So again, contextualizing that with the athlete that you're working with might be an issue there. But for, um, and I wanted to highlight this as well because I know it's a general running club. I know you guys have got a lot of members. I don't know who's going to see this. Please don't buy weight loss supplements. Most of the things that you will see there are just low calorie foods. And caffeine, again, it only works but into a very small amount. So it's statistically significant, but whether it's physiologically significant is a matter of debate. And you become naive to it anyway pretty quickly. So don't think you're going to be just sipping coffee and getting as lean as some of my athletes do. Trust me, I tried it. It doesn't work. Especially when you have muffins at the same time. It offsets it a little bit. <laughs> Um, obviously, ephedrine and stuff like that as well is banned, so, but that's just one of their recommendations. But for you guys, in terms of that, carbohydrates, potentially electrolytes if you're going long enough, because that might cause some kind of issue there. Um, so yeah, sports drinks are carbs, sometimes electrolytes, carbohydrate powders, and then gels. Um, and then, yeah, creatine works as well, but whether that's contextual. The other supplements there, apart from caffeine, because obviously caffeine's a stimulant, so it can lift fatigue. So. A little bit of caffeine whilst you're plodding along isn't necessarily a bad idea, as long as you don't get too jittery and nervous on it. <coughs> Again, individualization. But the problem with this, and the reason I've highlighted those three there, uh, sorry, those two really, creatine just kind of snuck in, um, is because a lot of people think, well, it's a performance enhancing supplement, therefore I need to use it, okay? You have enough glycogen stored in your liver and your muscles to sustain you for around about 90 minutes, 60 to 90 minutes of activity. So if you're going on a short training run, and you're coming back and you're having to sip on, you're spending, even spending your money just from a financial perspective, you're spending it on, you know, sports drinks and things like that as well. You just, it's not going to have any real performance benefit. Okay. I see this all the time. I worked in quite a few gyms in my time. You see people on the treadmill with a, trying to burn fat with a Lucozade sport and you're like, <laughs> not only you're reducing your fat, fat oxidation by having carbohydrates, you're also, um, you're also just, it's the calories that are king in that situation. So you lose it as well. So yeah, don't get caught up in that marketing. Um, but there, there might be a time and place. For example, if you're doing something in a marathon, it's going to take you a long time. We've discussed, and you've only got so much stored, so we might need to use those things in the right place. And I'll talk about how much we need to do that in a minute. So, has anyone heard of a periodized nutrition or fuel for the work done? You may have heard it called like train low, compete high variations and stuff like that. Okay, this is interesting. I'm glad I've come with something a little bit new as well. So, this is from a paper... Um, by so the last two authors on that are Graham Close, who's England rugby's performance nutritionist, and he's a Facebook friend of mine, so that basically means he's my best mate. And the guy at the end there is uh, James Moore, and he's the nutritionist for Team Sky, so yeah, pretty knowledgeable dude. And both those guys, it's a really weird connection. I didn't realize this until a few weeks ago when I actually tried to contact them to come and do some talks. And um, both those guys are my cousin, is their lab tech at Liverpool John Moores University, so he does all the experiments on this. Um, which is, yeah, just a weird coincidence, really, but a nice thing to try and get them to come and do some talks. So they're, they're pretty cool dudes in the sense that they do a lot of applied stuff. They do mechanistic stuff as well. 
And basically, what they do is it's fuel for the work done. So if you've got really high training volumes, now look at some of these here. Day one, four to six hours high intensity session, considering multiple intervals at above your lactate threshold. That's what these pros are doing. Okay, so on those days, what you want to do is you want to feed lots and lots of carbohydrates. Why do you want to do that? Because high intensity performance is mostly fueled by carbohydrates. So if you're trying to get a training adaptation, you want to fuel the training. So that's the idea of fuel for the work done. On the days where they're doing three to five hours low intensity, what they're doing there is they're training in a low carbohydrate state. Well, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just fuel to train better? So you can add to them what that on YouTube. Yes. And mechanistically, the way that does that, we talk about the metabolic flexibility, mechanistically the way it does that, and actually it might even have some crossover into high intensity performance, is because when our cells are placed under stress, that's what causes the adaptation. So bodybuilding, you lift the weight, you break down muscle, it comes back. When you exercise, you cause stress to the tissue, it forces an adaptation, that pathway before with all those fluggly things on, that's what that was. And that's exactly what you find there. So by training low, what they're doing is they are forcing cellular stress, but without having to get the stress of high intensity exercise. Because high intensity exercise is very fatiguing. Okay? It causes more muscle breakdown. It causes um, central, nerve, uh, central fatigue as well. So just overall fatigue. Whereas low intensity stuff, you can pretty much do it if you're at the right intensities, as frequently as you want for as long as you want. So you might, but you might as well make the most of those sessions while you do. Now, obviously, that's extreme. So how would we apply this to somebody like yourselves who maybe does you know, one high-intensity interval session a week or a couple of those, and maybe one or two low sessions a week as well? Well, we can implement this quite easily. And this is where the weight loss aspect of things tied in. Because what we would do there is on the days when we're doing high-intensity intervals, we just give ourselves more carbs and maybe give ourselves the right amount of calories that we need to sustain that. But on the lower days, what we can do is reduce our calorie intake to create a calorie deficit so that we can then get these adaptations of training low, still lose weight, but then still be able to put fuel the performance on the higher intensity days as well, right? Now that sounds really, really complex, and it can be. So what, to work with an individual, and if it was the right environment, like a school environment, that's not what I'm trying to say, university environment, or in a lecture theater environment, what we could do is we could sit down and have a table, and you could plot when your training sessions are, and you could figure out where you need to eat and stuff as well. However, then you take my job, and then I, no one would ever pay me to do anything ever again. But what we can do is we can do this in different ways that are more sustainable to ourselves. So this is a really good resource. So the guy, I think that's, I can't see on there. Sorry, is that Asker's one? So yeah, um, Asker Yukendrup, ever heard his name? So Asker is basically the man when it comes to carbohydrate metabolism. He's done all the research on this stuff. Um, so I don't know how, how, when you have other people talking things as well. So everything... What I talk about today is evidence-based. This is an anecdotal, this is, this is the hard science of it, of what's coming out as well. Some of it, again, is very novel, like the last stuff, but this is ways you could implement this as well. So there's different methods to train low. You could go on a low-carb diet. However, the issue with that might be is what the body giveth with one hand, it taketh away with the other. So when we get better at oxidizing fats, we get worse at oxidizing carbohydrates because if we're not having carbs in the diet, why would the body have all the enzymes that then store and break down carbohydrate? So I see this a lot with bodybuilders. Bodybuilders will diet low carb, and then they come to carb up for a show to get full, because it fills the muscle out, because you hold water with glycogen in the muscle, and they can't get full, because their digestive system has down-regulated the carbohydrate transporters, and also their muscles have down-regulated the carbohydrates. Support. So all they do is they just get really high blood glucose and feel really shitty, right? <laughs> and then they wonder why they can't get a pump. And then like five or six days later, after putting carbs back in, they look phenomenal. So, but this is a microcosm of that as well. So we could do it, Context in which um, low-carb diets might be beneficial for performance. And notice there it says low-carb, not necessarily no-carb diets. So there's a difference there. So when we, you know with the uh, train low that Team Sky do, those guys with that duration, low to them is still a few hundred grams of carbs. It's just low relatively to their level of activity expenditure. Ketogenic diets, which has been getting a lot of the rage. Like, there's a few issues with that. One is all the positive research comes out of one research group, which is funded by a guy who's got a book saying low-carb diets are amazing. Um, slightly problematic there from a bias perspective. But also, it might be useful for super ultra-endurance athletes, because if you can oxidize more fat, okay, you're not going to be as good as glucose, but you've got a basically untapped resource of energy there. The problem is, if you get caught in a sprint finish, sorry, carb wins. You get At my event, for example, it's in Snowdonia. There's a pretty big mountain there. If I need to go in, if I need to go into zone high zone four, zone five, pfft, yeah, damn right, I want some glycogen left. So I might want glycogen sparing from this metabolic flexibility we talk about, but I don't want to ever go low. 
Um, train after an overnight fast. So if you're gonna do your long runs, do them in the morning. And then eat afterwards. You're still gonna cause that cellular stress which causes the adaptation. Um, no carbohydrate during recovery again. So if you train later overnight, if it's a nice general, don't feel just the need to get into that pre-programmed, oh, well, I've trained now, I need to eat carbs. Look at your total energy expenditure. Look at what your overall goals are. And you can adjust from that point there. Um, sleep low, same principle again. So don't eat before you don't eat later in the evening before you go to bed. And she can still maybe get some food in the morning if you do want to eat that as well. But again, it's contextualized. If someone comes to you and goes, I can't, if an athlete comes to me and says to me, oh, I can't um, train on an empty stomach, I'm not going to just all of a sudden say fasted. So bear in mind as well, it says, um, where it says, where is it? Training after an overnight fast. That means of carbohydrates. If you wake up in the morning, you're still hungry, you could still have like a high fat meal or a protein meal. It's the low glycogen state. Even if you weren't trying to lose weight, you could use it to that advantage because you could still create an environment where you're going to be oxidizing mostly fat and reducing glycogen. So this is called a glycogen threshold hypothesis. So basically when your glycogen levels get really low, that's what triggers these reactions. I should have mentioned that in a bit earlier, it just occurred to me. Long training session without carbohydrate. So one of the things we can do is with that VO2 max testing, because VO2 max is basically all it does is it measures the amount of oxygen you take in versus carbon dioxide. And we know one molecule of oxygen creates one molecule of carbohydrate. So we can then work from that from our oxygen uptake, how many grams of carbohydrate you're burning. So theoretically, what I could do is I could do a VO2 max test on you, work how many grams of carbohydrates you're burning per hour at specific intensity, and then we just fuel you on a, on a long ride to the point in which I know your glycogen stores are going to be depleted. So when you see all this performance physiology stuff and you don't know why they're doing it and it's just because it's numbers on a screen, yes, it's great to be able to test things, but unless you can apply that rationally in an applied set and it's just numbers for numbers sake and athletes hate that, you know, you need to be able to explain to them what it is that you're actually doing and what the benefit is they're going to get from that as well. Uh, and then obviously training twice a day, but then you wouldn't replenish glycogen in between. So if you like to do that, some people do. I like training twice a day. So I'll do, for example, I'll do my swims in the morning, low intensity, because I can't swim fast because <laughs> I'd drown at this point. Um, so I'll train low intensity in the morning, my swim. And then later on in the day, I might go for a run and that as well. So even if I've eaten more the night before because I've had a high intensity session, or maybe I've been to Dublin at the weekend and I was a bit hungover, so I decided I needed some carbohydrates to make me feel better, um, which definitely didn't happen this weekend. And I'm definitely not really struggling now as well. So this is, a, this is the most hungover I've ever spoken in front of anybody. Um, so that's another first as well. Um, alcohol as well on an interesting point. Have you ever noticed that you crave carbohydrates when you've been drinking? That's because it reduces your capacity for hepatic glucose output. So that means that your liver can't put out glucose efficiently, so that's why your blood sugar starts to get lower, and that's why you want to eat crap sugary foods. Also reduces muscle protein synthesis, which is the creation of new proteins within the muscle, and probably mitochondrial as well. I've never looked at that, something to look at. So that means then as well your muscles don't recover as quickly. So yeah, alcohol, so rugby players, Right, that game, that game there, where the first picture of me, we used to play rugby every Wednesday, and every Wednesday night we'd have a social. So that's absolutely brilliant for recovery, that to be affecting your glyc capacity to store and release glycogen and also protein as well. So there's ways you can do it without necessarily having to go on these ridiculously long rides if we're careful. And we can also tie that into weight loss as well, which is pretty cool for those who want to improve those things there. Um, so to kind of finish on really, carving up. Basically, there's people talk about depleting car carbohydrate in order to need to carb up. Um, the research on that is mixed. I'd say don't bother. The, the perils of trying to deplete your glycogen by doing like intervals and stuff and the fatigue that might cause is probably not worth it. Um, 8 to 12 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. Please think lean body mass here as well. So if you are carrying a little bit of extra fluff, um, just kind of... Have a little, just be a little bit pragmatic and go to the lower end of the spectrum with that as well. What I would say is use a mix of sources because it's going to use you on your digestive system and I'll talk about that in just a second in a bit more detail. Obviously low fibre is probably best. Anyone ever eaten a lot of fibre when they've gone for a long run before? Yeah, right, okay. Don't need to, oh yeah, I learned that one the hard way, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Thank God Costa's open early in the morning <laughs> and, they're ev and they're literally everywhere now. Um, split over two to three days depending on your size. You don't need to be doing like five, six day carb ups. You can fuel enough um, unless you happen to be a jack bodybuilder trying to do an ultra marathon. The only reason I'd say it'd be slightly longer, um, you can only really uptake 60 to 90 grams of carbohydrates per hour, depending on the source. So obviously if you need to put a lot of carbohydrates into you, then you're gonna need time to digest that and absorb it and stuff as well. So that's the only reason why I say it would be longer. But even when I'm carving up bodybuilders who are very big and very lean, I, I don't need more than three days to do that because they can usually stomach um, you know, 
200, 300 grams of carbs in one meal and then just make them eat every three hours for three days and that works as well. Um, and I'd say three to four hours before, try and just get a decent meal of two to three grams per kilogram of low GI carbs, something that you typically eat as well. So, you know, low GI is quite difficult because it's the fiber that tends to make it low GI and actually some sugar, like table sugar is quite low GI. I know that sounds really confusing and I'll explain why that is in a second. I just saw a frown there as well. Yep, table sugar is low GI and I'll explain to you why. So table sugar is sucrose and sucrose is one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose that is lovingly stuck together. And basically what happens is fructose doesn't really elevate blood glucose levels. So it takes time to digest. Fructose is processed in your liver first and then it can be stored as glycogen. So if you want to refill your liver glycogen quickly, fructose is a pretty quick way to go. But that's, that's why it's a lower GI. So ice cream, for example, has got a lower GI than I think sweet potato. Which is, why when people, which is why when people talk about GI, it's very, very misleading. And I shouldn't really have used it there, and I've said that. But it's kind of good, it raises a point as well. Um, if you really want to lower the GI of a meal, for whatever reason, just stick a load of fat in it, because fat slows the digestion of carbohydrates. Um, but again, whether you'd want to take a high fat meal at this point would be dependent on what you were trying to achieve nutritionally for that event. Um, so yeah, if, but again, proviso, if you struggle to eat, if you struggle to eat that kind of food, sometimes we get nervous on a day of an event, particularly if it's our first one. I know when I'm doing my ultra, my ultra try, I'm going to be absolutely bricking it. I'm going to struggle to eat. Something is better than nothing, but just be careful about eating loads of sugar too close to the race because this can cause what's called reactive hypoglycemia, which can, it won't really necessarily affect performance, but it can make you feel a bit shitty. And if you are nervous, um, it might just put you off a little bit and might make you pull out previously. So when we eat carbohydrates, our body releases insulin. That's what stores carbohydrates in, in tissues, okay? Um, and that's also why, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll leave that. That was going off in a black hole again. Um, so carbohydrate releases insulin, that's stored in tissues. Muscle contraction is a more potent stimulator of glucose uptake than insulin is, okay? So if anyone's type 2 diabetic, you can actually regulate, uh, so they basically, they've accumulated so much fat within their tissues, they can't get an insulin response anymore. You can actually, if they exercise after meals as well, you can get really good glucose, blood glucose control as well. And you also get turnover and flux of fat in the tissue, which is actually really important. A lot of people don't realize this, is that endurance athletes, who, high level endurance athletes will store more fat, in their as much fat in their muscles as someone who's very obese. It's actually the turnover of fuel because they use it and replenish it, which is uh, important for health. So that's, so that's why even if someone's very overweight in the exercise, they will be healthier than someone who's overweight and doesn't exercise. Um, and on that point, ladies as well, um, you, it's why you're ten, if you have the same body fat mass as a man, you'd be healthier because men store their fat viscerally around their internal organs, which is what's bad for your health. Whereas you guys, although it's a pain in the backside, um, literally sometimes you store it around your hips and your waist, which means that, but subcutaneous fat isn't as damaging for your health. So from that perspective, then you get lucky. It's why women live longer than men, maybe. And plus men do stupid things like play rugby league and get drunk to that extent for several years in a row. Um, so yeah, basically when you contract the muscle, glucose gets uptaken. So if you have a big carbohydrate meal, your body releases the insulin, and then you contract the muscle, which does the same job. You get this jump of blood glucose so that you actually feel really hypo and you think, I need more carbohydrates. What's cool is though, once you've started exercising and you're trying to put those carbs in, the glute transporters, which is what transports, what insulin signals to pull to the surface to let carbohydrates in, once that's signaled, it's fine. They're at the surface there, they stay there. So you can take it all day long once you're actually going. So if you are feeling like you're struggling and it may be even if it's a shorter event, like a, a 10K, and you just feel like you need to fuel a little bit because you've not eaten beforehand, then once you've started, then get it in you as well. Try and keep it closer to it, like really close or really far away. Yeah, like 15, 20 minutes is probably when people feel terrible on it and they get really confused as well. And if you are doing that, make sure you're taking plenty of water. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever suffered with osmotic diarrhea, and it is exactly what it says on the tin. So like we said before, your body can only really absorb 60 to 90 grams per hour, depending on the source. And again, bodybuilders, what they will do is they'll try and carb up. But you also need water. Water and sodium helps with the uptake of carbohydrates. So that's why sports drinks tend to have electrolytes in them helps with the uptake. And they're usually concentrated around about six to eight percent solution. So six grams of carbs or glucose per 100 mil. And the reason for that is any more than that, your body can't uptake the glucose quickly enough. So it passes straight through your digestive system, gets into your colon, pulls water in there. Yeah, yep. So that's, that's why if you ever watch a lot of endurance athletes when they're trying to carb up a lot when they're running, I think Paula Radcliffe's probably the most famous incident of that one in the London Marathon. She had a little bit of a but it happens quite a lot for that reason. So it could be fiber, it could be other things as well. But you would think with her level of experience, it would have been 
she was probably feeling a bit crappy that day with performance, thought I'll get some more carbs in me, the solution might have been off and wrong as well. So they originally used to think, um, linked onto this actually, so they originally used to think that the most you could absorb in terms of carbohydrate was 60 grams per hour, but that was glucose. So if you ever look at Lucozade or most of those sports drinks, it's glucose that's in it. And that's because you have glucose transporters, but we also mentioned fructose before and table sugar. They have a different transporter. And the ratio of glucose transporters to fructose transporters in your gut is around about two to one, which is why you, get an, you can get an extra 30 grams of carbs in if you then take a glucose fructose mixture. So having, um, for a long time, the most widely, I don't know if this is true or not, or a wives tale, um, but the most widely, so you see all these people on the Tour de France, like Gatorade or Lucozade bottles or their whatever sports brand it was, um, but they were just pure glucose and they started to click onto this. So what they were actually doing is they just let Coke go flat because it's a high percentage, it's 12% carbohydrates, I think, or it was, before everything's now zero because of the sugar tax, which kills us as athletes. We shouldn't do too much that anyway. Um, so yeah, they, they were drinking flat Coke because you could actually take more carbohydrates in within that time period and then they would top it up with glucose. So that's why they think now it's like 90 grams as well. As we've said before though, if we look at this here, the duration of exercise, so whether you're running a 5K or a 10K, if it's 30 to 75 minutes, you don't need really to take any carbohydrates in as well. There's some really cool stuff on carbohydrate mouth rinse. So if you swill carbohydrates in your mouth, you will get a performance benefit. So if you train fasted, and the reason for that is because they think they've got receptors in your mouth, which then signal parts of your brain which elevate fatigue, alleviate fatigue. So you get that similar sort of thing um, as well. Anyway, one to two hours, about 30 grams per hour is sufficient. Two to three hours, 60 grams. If you do anything over two and a half hours, then we're looking to get 90 grams per hour on, 90 grams per hour in. On a bike, that's quite easy to do. Running, not so much as well. So one of the things I would encourage you to look at doing is if you are gonna try any of these feeding strategies, try it before the day and don't just think, oh, I'm gonna apply that in the context because you can actually train your digestive system to, to do this. So you can actually get enough regulation of these transporters in your gut. So if you are gonna try any nutrition strategies, don't do it for the first time on race day because science says so, because science doesn't care about your, you as an individual. You could be an outlier on that as well. Um, the important thing here is where it says recommend the carbohydrate type. So it says single or multiple transport. Well, multiple transport was what I was talking about there. It's a blend of glucose and fructose because then you can take them into the body. So up until two to three at 60 grams an hour, it doesn't matter because like I said before, we can do that in glucose. That's fine. We can handle that. If you need more than that doing the longer events, then that's where we need to start looking at the more multiple transportable carbohydrates. And there on the right-hand side, Nutrition training is recommended. That sounds a bit odd. That's not you guys sat here being lectured on it. Nutrition training is exactly that. So when you're trying these strategies, it is to try them out for yourselves with the fuel sources you'll be using on the day. If you've got an event, like say you're running a marathon, is it Manchester Marathon you guys have got coming up soon? Yeah. Manchester, London, yeah. Boston, yeah. Paris. So here's, here's, a bit of, here's a bit of help for you. Um, look at which sports drink sponsors are sponsoring the event and maybe get their brands beforehand. So you can try them to see how they sit with your digestive system. And then you know if you can get away with a little bit more or a little bit less in that as well. Because um, they are slightly different. Some are, don't do exactly what they say on the tin. So that's what nutrition training is there. So as you said, the more you need to get in there, the more that becomes important. Um, so obviously what I offer, and this is just a bit of sales pitch just in case you're wondering, but I've talked through it anyway. Um, performance analysis, nutrition coaching, strength and conditioning as well. I do have a background in that and I work with a lot of good guys. Um, body composition, health assessment, and metabolism testing. Ignore the bottom bit, that's some other project I'm working on at the moment as well. But if anyone wants to get involved with that, let me know, because it's something I'm launching for my first thing, which is basically a full performance package, but that's not it as well. Um, if anyone wants to follow me on Instagram and to listen to my rants, I'm actually quite placid on Instagram. I don't call people out who are nutritionists for national governing bodies. Um, that's Paul Rimmer PhD is me. At Be Better With Nexus is my business one, which I'm terrible at and I don't do. TRA Performance is my performance one. So that's me and my business partner, Lee Bell. Lee's a pretty cool dude. Um, he's doing his PhD in overtraining. Um, so he's really good with strength and conditioning stuff. He teaches masters in strength and conditioning. So when I do my strength and conditioning programs for my athletes, he's my consultant, which is quite nice to have because he's a very expensive man and I get him for free because I do the same thing for nutrition with any guys he's working with. So it works quite well. Um, that's my email there as well. And then I have a community on Facebook, which is around about 1,400 people, which is where I do most of my educational content. Um, and I'm vlogging as well my progress from jacked-ish bodybuilder to endurance athlete as well. So I talk about all the mechanistic stuff we talked about today in a lot more detail in terms of individualization. But that's it. Thanks for being here. It's been fun, I think. Um, and if you've got any questions, please feel free to ask them now.
Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it was just going back ages ago to so yes, one of your first uh, slides about vitamin D. Would that just depend about on the sunshine that we've got? Yes. So I think it's above the 37th parallel is the technical thing is where we need it. I don't know what a 37th parallel is, but I read it somewhere. It sounds clever. I think it's lines of latitude, longitude. GCSE, geog the G GCSE geography was a long time ago. Um, so yeah, that's the reason why. But I think, oh, and also as well, just on that. So the, the measure, it comes, sometimes comes in micrograms, but it's also measured in international units. So basically one IU is an amount that is effective in the body. That's what it stands out. So across different things, it could be a different amount. Um, with vitamin D, the current recommendations are off. They did the maths wrong on the original studies. So as a general rule, if you're looking to supplement with it, take between 20 to 60 IU per kilogram of body weight is the current recommendations. And that would normally be for both, for mo an, av an average person, be around about double what the current, if you get a supplement, which is like, I think it's five micrograms, this is about 500 IU, would be like double that, at least for most people. So yeah, they got the recommendation wrong. <laughs> Um, but for some reason, it's just kind of, it's not going to do you any harm to take a little, it's better than nothing. But like you said there, that guy, that athlete I had there was very much a yeah, performance athlete with a better diet that would have been rich in things like dairy, which tends to have more of the vitamin D and, and fortified foods as well. So yeah, vitamin D is one which is, is massive. Can you go over? Sorry? Can you go over? You can, but you'd really have to go some. Yeah, like I think it's, I think the, like the, it's not, it's not the, what's the, it's like the minimum, maximum, Minimum fatal dose or whatever it is, is like tens of thousands of IU. So yeah, if you're having like a thousand to two thousand IU per day, you're not going to do yourself any damage. Um, but again, part of what I do with my clients is I don't just give them vitamin D. I'm actually trained for botanist as well and I have a contract with a company that does blood health checks for me. So if I've got an athlete I suspect of having a deficiency, I test them, guess. So I'll pull their bloods, so we send it off to a lab, it comes back and then I can develop nutrition strategies for the individual. I don't mess about. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, vitamin D, take it. Especially over, especially over, or if you, even for shift workers is a good example, so it's not necessarily the summer if you don't get out very much, or if you're like me, you had an office which doesn't have any windows. You know, just if you think you're in it, or you're just very British and as soon as it gets sunny, you hide inside anyway and whinge about it, and then whinge when it rains. Um, so yeah. Um, when you were talking about the uh, high, low, in terms of calories to workload, mm -hmm. um, so would you give people a different calorie split per day, yeah. depending on what the training is, yeah. the, the whole idea of yeah. normalizing it? Yeah. yeah. But again, I wouldn't, I can't give you numbers on that because yeah. um, who here has an office job where they, who they sit down all day? Who here has a job where they walk around a lot? And yeah, mm -hmm. so your energy demands are going to be much higher. So when it comes to your total energy amounts of energy expenditure, your resting metabolic rate is the biggest contributor. So you just chilling at rest now is burning more calories over the course of a day than you would do from doing activity. What's interesting is people think exercise and massively overcompensate for the amount of exercise that they do. Um, well, actually, your biggest, your biggest other output, at least historically until we've had this move towards more sedentary jobs, is actually your non-exercise activity. So the stuff you do, walking the dog, um, you know, doing the dishes, doing the garden and stuff is a massive contributor to your total daily energy expenditure. What's fascinating about that is when people try and lose weight, what they'll do is they'll start going to the gym. They think they burn more calories than they do, especially if they use Fitbits and trackers because they massively overestimate your calorie expenditure burn. So don't think, oh, can I have that extra 500 calories? Unfortunately, it's much, much easier, as I'm sure the guys who track, even if they were ballpark, you'll appreciate, it's much easier to eat 500 calories than it is to burn 500 calories. Yeah, that's the problem with it. But what tends to happen is we get these people don't lose weight at the rate they think they should because you get these compensatory behaviors. So what they've shown, is if you go in the gym and you exercise and you burn some calories, people will come in and go, oh, I can't be bothered to walk the dog tonight, or oh, I won't do that. And like those little cumulative effects of training and the psychological thing, well, I'm going to the gym now, and then people get frustrated, and it's because they have these compensatory behaviors. So if I'm working with a weight loss client, I will get them to do things like track their steps and use Fitbits. Now, I said they're not accurate, but I don't care about accuracy, I care about consistency. So if they start with me and they're burning so many calories per day, I don't care if it's accurate, because the errors consistent across the board but then if their activity starts to drop then it's like right okay particularly with physique competitors so if you imagine how hard they're pushing their bodies to get lean everything about their body is fighting them to want to eat to want to rest you'll get to the point where actually people who are going to very low levels of body fat will actually fidget less like that's the, the things you do that you don't like if i was talking and i was dieting for a show now i'd probably just be like slumped in a chair wouldn't be using my hands at all you know but can i ask a question 
I'm training for my first ever okay. marathon. Mm -hmm. I'm hungry all the time, yep. but I'm not losing any weight. Okay. So what's going on there? Is it is am I eating wrong? Am I just um, so um, how you how you taking enough? Um, it's not going to it's not going to work. Okay, let's let's do a consultation soon. <laughs> <laughs> Show you the soft skills now as well. So, how many calories a day are you eating? I don't know. There's your problem. <laughs> I don't know, but when I'm, I guess what I have started to do, because I'm hungry, and I think I get some of that, that rebound hypoglycemia because if I'm at work, I'm surrounded by cakes and biscuits and crisps. So I basically took I took in on them and then feel absolutely ravenous. So I've in an effort to sort of try and curb that, I'm actually adding more food into my diet. You've just answered your own question. <laughs> yeah. And that's the skill of a coach. You let people answer for themselves instead of offering solutions. So this is really common. So we'll take you out that, that uh, thing for a second there. So our brains, unfortunately, evolution has hardwired us to seek out high calorie, high palatable foods. It makes sense. We never used to know where food was coming from. And our brains absolutely love the perfect combination of carbohydrates and fats, almost in a perfect 50-50 ratio. Think about all the foods that are really tasty and easy to overeat on. Ice cream, sugar gets the blame, fatty. Chocolate, sugar gets the blame, also really fatty. Pizza, love pizza, um, gets the blame. Things like burgers it's, or chips, it's a combination of fats and carbs that really light those pleasure centers up in the brain. Just as a proviso there, that doesn't mean they're addictive. People who say food's addictive, it's not the same thing as a heroin overdose. You don't see people breaking into Tesco to do lines of sugar. <laughs> Preposterous. So, um, until I've used that line before, it's always a good one, always a good one. Um, so yeah, but that's the reason. So uh, when you get your, let yourself get hungry, what you're doing is you're then seeking out those foods that you know are gonna, one, make you feel better, but two, there's high calorie density because evolution has driven you to do that. Um, so the way to do that is be more planned on your foods, be more cognizant about your eating behaviours, you've identified already what you're doing, so start putting strategies in place, because I'm sure you're, you're an intelligent enough person to acknowledge it, so start developing strategies yourself that will help you do that. So things like when you feel those things, um, start to look for lower GI foods, because you're going to get the same impact. Start to have more protein in your diet. Protein is the most satiating nutrient as well, so from a weight loss perspective it keeps you fuller. Um, so that's why, again, trying to drop body fat, high protein diets tend to work, <coughs> better for appetite regulation as well. So it's about, a lot of the time, it's about strategizing. It's not about changing diet necessarily. It might be tweaking one or two things. It's about identifying. So controlling your food environment is a massive one. I, it's surprising to a lot of people, because I've competed and stuff, that I have actually real, real terrible food control. Like, I really struggle around junk food. Like, if it's in, if I go back to my parents' house, I just raid the cupboards. I don't even try and stop myself anymore. But guess what? You guess what I do when I'm not at my parents' house? I don't buy crap from my cupboards, so then I don't ever get tempted to do it. It's difficult at work, though. So sometimes it is one of those things where it's like you maybe have to avoid certain situations until you regain control over those foods. So sometimes we have to admit we're a little bit weak. Do something structurally to prevent us getting access to those foods. And then from that point there, then when you've got some confidence back and you're getting results, then it's like, okay, now I see those results from reducing those foods. Then you've got a positive association with missing out on those foods, not a negative one from feeling hungry and needing them because they make you feel better. So that's the applied behavior change stuff that I was talking about previously, which is so far detached from the mechanistic stuff, but is infinitely more important even for professional athletes, but nobody talks about it, except me. Any more? Um, going back to vitamin D, okay. yep. so how quickly can you become deficient? Uh, like if you spend a lot of time in the sun, so, are you good to go for a couple of months? Or yeah, no, I couldn't tell you time-wise, it's probably very individual. I don't know what the variability is. Again though, it's not necessarily about deficiency, it's about optimal. So you might feel a little bit sluggish, you might, you know, to go to, go to the point of deficiency where like, for example, vitamin C, you go end up with scurvy, right? Um, you're going to have to not eat vitamin C for a long time. Like if you don't eat vitamin C every day or foods containing vitamin C, you'll be fine. So it's not about it's not about having the minimal responsive dose. It's the benefits it gives people generally in typical terms of energy, bone formation. And as we get older, we get less efficient at storing nutrients. So older people need more protein, which is a big issue. There's a study I'm trying to get involved with at the moment at um, Leeds Beckett University, which is looking at sarcopenia, muscle loss in the elderly. Vitamin D is a treatment for that because it's an easy win. Mag usually combined with magnesium and calcium. But also, um, the problem is protein is so satiating that they try and give older people more protein because their anabolic switch, their muscle building or muscle retention switch is turned right down. So they give them more protein, but protein's filling so they consume less calories so then they get overall muscle waste. So it's really difficult. So they're actually trying to develop a 
kind of gel which is just amino acid which doesn't satiate people but even the gels which you would think aren't food volume are so satiating that these people so yeah they're trying to develop strategies to do that as well so it's a project that's just um, I can't even pronounce the guy's name, which is really bad. He's a Greek dude with a ridiculous name, like a proper ridiculous Greek name. So he just says, just call him Theo. So I'm trying to badger, badger him at the moment to get in and looking at some of that as well. Um, that sort of stuff. So like I do work with people across the spectrum because, like I said before, if you don't have health, you can't have performance. You need to know, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be like a diabetes specialist or anything like that or a cancer specialist, but you need to know a bit about that stuff to kind of push people as well. But yeah, so I wouldn't know what the minimum amount is. I wouldn't say be overly concerned about it because you'd start to get <clears> symptoms. <throat> like you'd notice it. But sometimes there's a difference between suboptimal and deficient as well. So what I work towards is optimal because people pay me money. That's what I want. I want them to be at their very, very best, not just getting through life. You know. So that's the perspective I would take with that. So if you've had a blood test and it says you're vitamin D levels are five, yeah, should you nice. supplement or do you think it's as an athlete? It's better to supplement. That's a good question. Um, if your vitamin D levels are fine, then that's fine. But then there's also an issue with how data is collected and corroborated. So what they do is they look at a bell curve and you go, right, if you're between that and that and you've got enough, that's enough for health. But the amount you might need, your blood amount might be different metabolically. So I would always say if you can get someone to the, up, the upper safe limit, then you're definitely covering the 95% of the population because you take an average. Whereas actually, you meet one of these guys up here and needs more. So I always push people towards the other side of them. Um, just what you mentioned, magnesium. In terms of things like restless legs, mm -hmm. is supplementing useful or is the absorption rate not good enough? Magnesium. There's a lot of things with like sprays yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Around magnesium type is um, can be a big issue. So just taking magnesium within itself isn't that as well. I think the oral stuff does, again, it depends on the type of thing that's better, better uptake. But that's something that I don't want to talk about too much because it's not something that I'm massively au fait with. I know it's important, but I was, so what's really weird, I've actually got a meta-analysis saved on my phone that one of my friends shared because I wanted to read up on that as well. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I'm going to be non-committal about that, but the type does matter. If you want a good resource on supplements, by the way, and I should have put it as a reference on this, there's a website called examine.com and it's a completely independent resource for supplements. So if you type in anything, and it has anything on there, Weight loss, muscle building, um, magnesium. It will it will break it down the scientific research into either really technical stuff. It gives you the full references as well, but it will also um, it'll also give you like a really simple overview. Do you need to take it? What contraindications should you look for? It will probably answer your vitamin D question as well, and definitely answer the magnesium question. Um, so I'll refer to that one because that's their expertise. Um, I I take a food first approach. So I don't really, if, if I need a client that needs supplements, there's only very specific context, context where they would need that. And if they need supplements, then they probably need to improve their diet because dietary sources tend to be better absorbed anyway. Um, there's, there's only specific situations where you probably def, definitely need supplementation for overall health. So vegan diets would be one of them as well. But you can't tell vegans that. So if there is anyone, I apologize because it's almost like, it's almost like you're criticizing their entire lifestyle. From an ethical and moral perspective, it's admirable, but you have to acknowledge that there's potential health implications if you get it wrong. That's not the same. It's not an equivocal argument. I'm not attacking veganism. I'm saying if you follow that diet, you need to be careful with certain things. I was going to ask, uh, actually, for vegetarians and vegans, what are the things that they typically lack and should be um, looking towards yeah. increasing? He heme iron. So the iron that we get from red meat, Pesky red meat is very different to the iron that we get from plants. So if you are going to have like things like spinach and stuff are rich in iron, but your body doesn't absorb them very well. So if you're going to have, and this is why raw vegans are really, really at risk because cooking actually helps you access a lot of those nutrients. So um, vitamin D might be one as well, but you can get fortified cereals and stuff. So that's not too issue. You can supplement with it. Um, protein in itself can be problematic because unfortunately plant-based proteins aren't what you would call quality proteins. So just to qualify that statement slightly, a protein is quality if it contains all the essential amino acids your body needs for repair and recovery. Um, most plant sources aren't, with the exception of soy protein, but soy, soy protein, so things like tofu and um, stuff like that. Um, corn, I think, does. Microproteins now, all that kind of stuff, are being manufactured to have a better uh, amino acid profile. Um, but you can also do that about with combining different foods as well. So you can have uh, like rice, rice and peas. They've got both different types of protein source, which then provide all the essential amino acids as well. Um, things like nuts and whole grain breads is another one you can do. Um, aside from that, quinoa, 
or quinoa as I called it until I went to Cardiff and got surrounded by pretentious people. Um, quinoa, for example, I think has got all the essential amino acids. Spirulina is a good thing to add to shakes. You're testing my memory now. Um, and there are a few other uh, gluten. So seitan, seitan, never pronounced that right, is another one which has it as well. So you can do it. It just needs a little bit more care and consideration. Um, anything else that would be would be iron would be a typical one. Potentially zinc as well because the uh, absorption of that is very low. So if you are having salads and stuff that are high in iron, then always try and add lemon juice or citrus to it because vitamin C increases iron absorption and zinc as well. So it acts to co-transport that into the into the body. Um, what else would there be? Calcium potentially. So look for calcium supplementation as well. Um, And off the top of my head, that would be it, I think. But yeah. What about granola? Sorry? Granola. What's Protein. It? Protein. Yeah. And carbohydrates. Well, carbohydrates would be fine, because yeah. you can get carbohydrates from plant. Well, granola contains carbohydrates and protein. Yeah, but it's I mean, not. I mean, we all know it makes you go to the Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, this, well, if you're going to talk about high-protein plant sources, nuts and seeds, but that comes with a calorie cost. Yeah. So that's one of the issues with vegan diets when people try and eat enough protein, is if you don't choose, I'm trying to name the lower calorie options, because if you do, I know five, that bran is one. I don't know the amino acid profile about bran, so you probably know better than me on that one. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, so from my perspective, they're the ones that I would put into my athletes' programs, because actually... I can then adjust their carbohydrates much more easily because they're lower calorie, not necessarily low calorie, but lower calorie than nuts and seeds and stuff, which they're great. Nuts and seeds are awesome. I'm not bashing on them, but it's very easy to overeat on those things. And despite what people will tell you, calories do matter from fats. Um, so yeah, just, just it, it's, it can be challenging. But as endurance athletes, that's not bad because uh, if, you've, if you've got high training loads, then it's fine. It's not so, it's not so difficult with endurance people. It's just more the protein amounts because you just ignore them, generally speaking, as a population, not just vegans. So eat more protein. I just ask what uh, modern view is of carb loading. I covered that a little bit there. So carb loading is important, but it's event specific. Like, you know, you're not going to deplete your glycogen in, a, in like a half hour 5K. But if you're doing a marathon, then yeah, carb load. But just again, it's risk versus reward. If you've not done it before, then do it gently the first time. Use lower amounts to... So you know, see how you feel. You know, it's, it's experience, it's individualization. So carb loading is something that most athletes will do. It's still recommended. It's just the aggressiveness with which people do it. Like, you know, people will go four or five day carb benders. And after a certain point, you're just eating more fuel that's going to sit in your stomach and not digest and, and just not make you feel better. So yeah, I covered that before with the about eight to 10 grams per kilogram body weight per day, split over a couple of days would be where the research says, don't worry about depleting it as well. Any particular types of food that I'm Whatever you enjoy. Less than those. A low fiber, so not bran. Yeah. Low fiber, because it's not going to upset your stomach. But anything you enjoy and you eat typically, again, don't make the perils of thinking like, oh, well, um, to think, you know, Mo Farah eat carbs up on those things, therefore I should do it. Well, he probably eats those right the way through his entire training. So he's used to those carbohydrates. So stick with what you know and you enjoy, because they'll be more palatable as well. For a lot of people, eating that amount can be difficult. So almost you want more palatable foods. And don't be afraid if you are struggling to get it in there, to throw some junk in there as well. But only at those times, okay? Again, it's it's not every time you go on a training run. It's just for those two or three days before that as well. Yeah. Traditionally, it's like rice, uh, That's fine. potatoes, yeah. pasta. Yeah, yeah. So all, all perfectly yeah. legitimate. Yeah. Car carbohydrate type doesn't really matter. It's the amount of it. Unless you start getting to that point where you need to absorb more per hour than 60 grams. So again, I would just say have a meal of white like, pasta, and then just have some fruit with it as well, and then you've got. In terms of like energy gels and stuff, yep. um, obviously the, the research has increased a lot recently. But is the absorption rate of the typical energy gel now does it actually work during a race, or is it that you're going to then get a blood glucose spike you twenty hours later? Yeah, the absorption rate's fine, but that would no. Your absorption rate would be determined by your hydration status with it. Yeah. So if you're just taking energy gel after energy gel, you're probably going to have an issue digesting it, like for the reasons I said before. Yeah. So as long as you're taking around about 100 mils of water for every six to eight grams of carbs, but again, when you're running, trying to fuel is difficult, which is why it's really difficult to get to 90 grams of carbs per hour unless you really do train yourself. But so the other thing to take from this as well is just there's a, a philosophy. There's a guy called Lauren Balk who's one of the some people who are really into their sports science may have heard of him. He's one of the leading performance nutritionists in the UK. 
He's a consultant. He works with loads of Premier League players and stuff. So these guys have nutritionists on tap and they go to him to work with him. He's a cool dude as well. Um, and he said, like, just because just because you can, should you? Just because you can do that, should you do it? So we talk about this nutrition training side of things as well. Just because you can take 90 grams of carbs per hour, you know, there's usually a cost involved with that, having to stop and drink, making yourself feel sick as well. So it's not just like, okay, that's, don't think I'm saying, right, you need to consume 90 grams per hour, okay? Again, if we've got metabolic flexibility as well, depending on where we are on the spectrum, we might be fine with lower amounts than that because we're oxidizing more fat anyway. And if you're just going for a two hour, two and a half hour, three hour, not two and a half hour plod, but like a three, four hour marathon, or plodding it, just because it's your first one, for example, then don't really worry about making, just drink when you feel thirsty, <coughs> make sure you're taking some food on there as well, but just don't overforce it until you've got that experience. Could be, yeah. Uh... So, you touched on to the best carb load with longer distances. I think particularly when you mentioned 5K is not really necessary. What sort of profile would your nutrition take leading into a 5K, like say, night before or earlier that day? I'd still, call, I'd still carb up. I'd still have something to make sure I was full, but I just wouldn't necessarily be as aggressive. But a lot of this would depend on what taper you're using with an athlete. So if you if you've got an athlete who's done an aggressive block of training, so they're going to be in a depleted state, like in that last week, then I'm going to be more aggressive with the amount of carbs they need. If I've got someone who's come to me who's not trained for a week, who's been eating high carbs all week, you're not just going to all of a sudden miraculously you're going to get more glycogen storage because you've eaten more carbs the night before. You've still got to deplete it before you replete it. So if you've eaten say. Let's say you've done no training that week and you've eaten 600, 500 grams of carbs a day or 400 grams of carbs a day, you're going to be full. So the only thing I would be concerned about is the next morning is making sure you've got a carbohydrate-rich meal. So your blood glucose is always kind of high anyway, so you've already got a little bit in your blood glucose ready to go. So you're kind of just topping up the bit you're going to use. Um, but then once you get into it as well, so I'm saying this again, for even a lot of people, they probably don't need to carb up as aggressively as they do. Again, it's more the elite spectrum, which is why I said do it on the lower end. But again, again, to quantify that, it's a really good question you've asked there because I should have explained that better. It would really depend on what your training looked like into that as well. I was going on the assumption, possibly wrongly, that a lot of people will go build their intensity and what they'll do is they'll then taper into doing a marathon. Yeah. So if you build your intensity, that usually means your body's under a lot of stress and so you need to feel fuel carbs to make sure that stress is off the body. And that's actually more, potentially more as well for your central nervous system because it loves glucose. So it's not just about you know making sure your glycogen stores are full. Your central nervous system is recovered and everything is firing neuromuscularly. Has anyone ever seen The Crawl? Have you ever seen The Crawl? This is really cool. Go, wait, get a chance, go onto YouTube. It's an ultra, it's, a, it's an Ironman. And these, I don't know what they did with the few, few, it was when Ironman first became a thing. And there's basically a race, and I think it was like third and fourth place. And the women on it get so, they're so depleted of glycogen, they physically can't run anymore. Because your body just starts to pull glucose from everywhere to protect your brain and your essential function. And these guys are like, they're walking, their gait goes completely and all that kind of stuff. It's crazy. Because they probably had, were probably just, you know, they tanked, they didn't fuel properly, but they probably didn't have that metabolic flexibility to tap into their, to their fats as well. So for ultra endurance stuff will be different for short durations. But then there's the other side of it as well. There's also, if you, let's say you did get glycogen compensation, you only want to fuel for the work done because if you're holding more glycogen, you're holding more water, so your power to weight goes down. On a short distance, that's going to impact you more because it becomes more about power to weight than it does about your fuel storage capacity. Again, it's, it's context, and that's why I don't really try to talk too much in absolutes about performance nutrition until I've seen someone's training program, see how they respond, and quite often I still get it wrong. Like that's the reality of it. It takes time working with someone, with an athlete, to figure out exactly the best approach with them, exactly the right foods. So that's why I do practice races and stuff as well until you get good. So I'm sorry for not answering your questions, but that's as good as I can be. Apologies, I arrived late, so if you've mentioned this, apologies for that. Um, in terms of vitamin D, yeah. uh, sunlight versus supplementation, uh, another question is related to muscle soreness in yeah. terms of uh, prevention and recovery mm -hmm. from. Yeah. Okay, so vitamin D, sunlight is just as good. In fact, it's stronger, I think, than vitamin D supplementation, which is the actual length of exposure to it. Again, I couldn't tell you the exact numbers. Um, maybe next time I come back and I'll do a vitamin D presentation while everyone's answers. Um, again, so I don't know, but as a general rule, if you're getting enough sunlight, you wouldn't need to concern doing it. So if you're if you're an outdoor worker in the middle of summer, then don't worry about it. So there are any significant benefits of sunlight versus consumption of? Uh, it's just it's you you'll get elevations quicker. I think. Don't quote me on that, but I think yeah. you get it's you get a better reaction quickly from that as well. 
Yeah. So, um, but again, it's one of those things. It doesn't. Does it matter if you get vitamin D over one, like increase it over one day or over four days? Like as long as it's you're, you're taking care of that, it's fine. But I think sunlight is it increases vitamin D quicker, as most natural process, most not all, but most natural processes do tend to favour that as well. Because um, normally with it, sunlight hits your skin, cholesterol is converted to vitamin D. Winner with vitamin D, it has to usually be processed in the liver, then convert to its active form. Making me question myself now. <laughs> and then in terms of muscle soreness, I mean, so, yeah, so there's quite a lot of people use ice baths and stuff for muscle recovery. And again, this is getting into an area where is isn't my bread and butter, but I, I'm very fortunate in that I do know a lot of people who do this stuff. So uh, high dose omega 3s, we talked before. High dose omega 3, so um, is, is known to reduce DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, protein again would be the first thing I'd always look at if you're doing something novel like a big jump in distance or a change in intensity you will get muscle soreness um, it usually comes from the east so it'd normally be like glutes and hamstrings where most people get their muscle soreness unless, unless they're very new to it and it's because it's the, it's the eccentric loading so as the muscle lengthens is what causes muscle soreness so yeah omega 3s high dosage is that like 5-6 grams a day I wouldn't do that long term but if you're struggling um, you can just use anti-inflammatories if you so choose to get it down. The problem is though, I'm not trying to not get too technical with this. <laughs> so the problem is, is then we get an inflammatory response and we get soreness. That's part of the stress response which causes your body to adapt. So you, if you quell that response too significantly, you might not get the adaptations that you want. So a bit of soreness isn't a bad thing. It just means you probably need to back off for a few days or just change your train intensity. But that doesn't mean you can't train on DOMS as well. So you can still train with ache, but you just, I wouldn't be doing any blasting sessions, which is going to thing as well. But yeah, say protein, omega 3s, overall carbohydrate intake would be, you know, if you're really struggling. And then just training exposure. So as you build up that tolerance to the stress, it, it goes away really. Um, so then training on DOMS, I was under the impression because your muscle tissue is damaged that you. So here's what's interesting, DOMS doesn't necessarily indicate muscle damage. Mechanistically, I'm not sure why, but if you, the assumption like for someone's trying to build muscle, if they don't get a muscle ache, they're not building muscles wrong, and it works both ways as well. So I think to use DOMS as an indicator of a hard training session is wrong. Um, would I necessarily train if I had severe DOMS? It would depend if it was causing me actual physical pain, because um, DOMS is the inflammatory component, which is usually associated with damage, but it's residual. So it's not necessarily the actual damage itself, if I recall. But again, I'm not a muscle physiologist. I should have put my business partner's name up there and he could have told you that perfectly. So I don't want to be too misleading with that as well, but I know from a bodybuilding perspective, DOMS isn't associated necessarily with muscle damage. You can get significant muscle damage without delay DOMS. And it's, it's um, related to immediate consumption and being vegan? Um, yes, because obviously fish oils are a problem. You can get it extracted from algae. Uh, I think it's a type of algae where you can get really good quality, actually, omega-3s from um, algae sources as well. So that's plant source. So, yeah. I should have mentioned that earlier. That's a good question. All right, any other questions? Uh, just one. Yeah. The tassing, does that have any beneficial uh, effects Because yeah. I remember in the past, there were lots and lots of Cyclists, yeah, just to carry banana or to yeah. So exactly, the days of gels, essentially. So sodium potassium are your two primary electrolytes that are involved in muscle contraction. Again, I'm yeah. starting to venture out of my territory here in towards muscle physiology stuff. So I don't want to talk about this too, too, um, too like in an expert manner. But basically, most people, even when you're doing short short duration stuff, will be consuming enough potassium and sodium in their diets. Don't even need to worry about it. If you're doing longer events, it might be an issue. Um, but again, your body gets really good at regulating those things. So like sodium will like efflux and influx with potassium in and out of cells, which is what causes nerve signals to transmit some neuromuscular stuff um, and also encourages fluid balance. Your body will start to retain potassium and sodium from your sweat if you lose too much of it anyway, if you start to become dehydrated. So I wouldn't say like obsessing about potassium was something which was essential, but if you, you know, if you do feel like you're getting, because this is one of the interesting things as well, is like even things like cramps and stuff, we don't really know what causes cramps. So some people will just take electrolytes and but it'll have no effect. We, you know, there's certain times it might be due to low potassium, 
but again, very individual. And how would you know? But again, what I would do is I would look at a diet strategy of someone, look at the diet and think, well, if the potassium is off the end of the spectrum, then we just give them some more potassium rich food, like a banana, like you suggested. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say people need to focus on it and take it unless they had a low potassium diet. Um, but there are some situations when you might want that. But dangerous low potassium is obviously really bad because I know it can kill you. But again, that's bodybuilders being idiots a lot of the time, trying to manipulate fluid balance as well. Um, so yeah, I don't want to talk too much about whether you should or shouldn't load potassium because if the message gets misconstrued, it could do someone some damage. And the first rule of anything to do with medical health is first do no harm. So work from that perspective backwards. Well, thank you very much for joining. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you.